This week is a remarkable week of the war, for this week sees the defenses of not one, but two of the Central Powers completely collapse. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week, the oil city of Baku fell to the Ottomans, but things went far worse for them on the Palestine front. After cutting off Ottoman communications, the British broke through their lines between Rafat and the Mediterranean Sea and closed in on Nazareth. On the Macedonian front, a couple of Allied attacks and a mutiny among the Bulgarians led to a sudden Allied breakthrough there. So sudden, the Allies didn't even realize it. There was also a smaller Allied breakthrough on the Western Front. Attacks on the Western Front continued. In fact, there were two new Allied offensives there this week. One was a huge Franco-American attack from Champagne to the Meuse River. The preliminary bombardment contained mustard and phosgene gas shells and incapacitated 10,000 Germans. At 5.30 a.m. on the 26th, the Americans went over the top, and at 6 a.m. the French followed suit. This was on a front of over 60 kilometers. Both armies advanced several miles. The Allies had a huge advantage on paper. For example, facing the Americans were five divisions at one-third strength. So the nine full U.S. divisions attacking had an eight-to-one manpower superiority over the Germans. But curiously, they had only 821 planes and 189 light tanks. And that was half of the mobile force they had had at the easier San Miguel offensive two weeks ago. And that was easier for this was a major challenge for the Americans. The advance was in a valley littered with streams and bounded to the east by the Meuse. The Meuse heights across the river were great for flanking fire. On the left were the heights of the Argonne Forest, and ahead lay the heights of Montfaucon and Romagne. The Germans had been here since 1914 and were well prepared to say the least, with all the barbed wire, concrete bunkers, and machine gun posts you could want. And they also had quite an efficient local rail system. They could bring up six reserve divisions in just 48 hours. There were three defensive systems, with the second and main one being the Kriemhildestellung. All of this protected the sedan metz railway line, for if that fell, the German armies to the north would be isolated. Allied Supreme Commander Ferdinand Foch had told American Commander John Pershing to take the Kriemhildestellung within two days. While they tried to do that, Henri Gouraud and the French were to push through Champagne toward Rheims. On the 27th, the Americans actually did take Montfaucon, but the Germans had already brought in four reserve divisions, and the idea of quickly taking the Kriemhildestellung turned out to be wishful thinking as the week came to an end. Still. The combined advance had taken 23,000 prisoners so far. The other new Western Front attack was a British one. British commander Sir Douglas Haig was now going to hit the German center, the Hindenburg Line. This was going to be a double assault, first on the Canal du Nord on the 27th, and then next week on the 29th on the saint quentin Canal. One aspect of the brilliance of that German defense system was that it integrated waterways into it, which had by now become even more significant because they were obstacles against tanks. The Canal du Nord was 30 meters wide and the West Bank was three or four meters high. Past that lay barbed wire belts and machine gun posts. The Germans also held some high ground that overlooked the whole area. The first and third British armies would attack and the Canadian Corps would spearhead this. Now, they didn't have as many tanks or planes as they'd had last month, since these were allocated for the saint Quentin attack, but they advanced under a heavy and accurate creeping barrage. According to David Stevenson, the infantry was to cross a dry section of the canal in waves and bring up artillery and machine guns. They made the crossing pretty easily, and engineers began building bridges. In fact, by the evening, they'd made a gap, a break in the Hindenburg line nearly 20 kilometers wide and 10 deep. They'd also taken 16,000 prisoners. However, the attack would slow down as next week begins, and though there was five days of continual fighting, the attack was called off after heavy Canadian casualties. It was also unable to support the saint quentin attack when that goes off, but that's in the future. The initial Canal du Nord attack had achieved total surprise, but the defenses were unable to be broken without it. It is interesting what different sources say about all this. Canadian Military History Journal 
contradicts Stevenson and says that Arthur Curry had his Canadians cross in flooded sections except for a narrow dry strip to hit the German flank. Here's some interesting numbers for you about all of this action. Now, the British War Cabinet had been worried for weeks that these attacks in the German center would turn into a second Battle of Passchendaele. British Chief of Staff Henry Wilson pointed out to them that during Passchendaele, the British had taken 265,000 casualties and 24,000 prisoners of war. During the month of August 1918, they'd taken just 50,000 casualties and captured 43,000. By crazy comparison, in the week ending September 24th, the British Expeditionary Force took 30,000 prisoners, more than they had in any other week of the war. The Allies were also taking prisoners by the thousands on other fronts. On the Palestine front, they continued their breakthrough, taking the Nazareth garrison at the beginning of the week. German commander Liman von Sanders was forced to flee in his pajamas. On the 21st, British infantry reached Samaria and drove the Ottomans into the British cavalry. East of the River Jordan, the Arab Revolt cuts the Damascus Railway in several spaces. 18,000 prisoners have now been taken. And in what Martin Gilbert called the most devastating aerial attack of the war, over 50 planes bombed and machine gunned the Turkish columns in the narrow defile of Wadi Farah as they tried to reach the River Jordan. They used 9 tons of bombs and 56,000 rounds. The bombers attacked the vehicles at the head of the column, and the rest then had to stop, so the men were sitting ducks. A second similar attack was launched the next day. Gilbert says that some of the pilots who bombed the defenseless retreating Turks were so nauseated by what they saw that they asked to make no further sorties. By the 22nd, the 7th and 8th Ottoman armies were basically wiped out. The British are north of the Dead Sea and closed the enemy's escape route. 25,000 prisoners by now. On the 23rd, the British reach Es Salt and the Arabs occupy Man, while on the coast, the British capture Haifa and Accra. On the 25th, the British cavalry reach the Sea of Galilee. Other cavalry units occupy Amman on the Berlin-Baghdad railway. 45,000 prisoners by now. As the week ends, the cavalry had ridden across the Golan Heights in Syria. Damascus lies just a hundred kilometers away. And another Allied breakthrough was also in progress on the Macedonian front. On the 21st, French and Serbian troops threaten the Babuna Pass. French Moroccan troops enter Prelep September 21st. For three years, this has been German headquarters. The Italians are to prevent the enemy from reaching Uskub, the railway hub. On the 22nd, the Bulgarians retreat on a hundred mile front from Monastir to Lake Doiran. The Allies cut the Vardar Railway and advance on the Babuna Pass. On the 23rd, the Bulgarians are routed and stream towards Velez with hot pursuit. The Serbs are now well north of the Vardar. The British north of Lake Doiran on the road to Strumica. On the 24th, the Serbs reach Grodsku, a key objective, and its fall cuts off the most direct line of retreat for the Bulgarians to Sofia, their capital. On September 25th, the Bulgarians propose an armistice, but Allied commander Franche Desperé, aka Desperate Frankie, refuses. The Serbs take the Babuna Pass and Velez. The British cross the Bulgarian border. On the 26th, they take Strumica. The Bulgarian defeats led to unrest in Sofia. Well, more unrest than usual for 1918. This spreads to other cities by the 23rd, and students began establishing Soviets. Officer cadets and the German soldiers who'd finally arrived from Crimea tried to disperse them, but on the 27th in Radomir, where retreating Bulgarian army mutineers had converged, a new republic was declared, with Alexander Stambolisky as president. He has the support of thousands of soldiers and will try and seize Sofia under 50 kilometers away. Those Bulgarian mutineers were from the mutiny I mentioned last week, but mutiny was by now a regular thing everywhere. This week saw the first mutiny in combat of Australian troops, when members of the 1st Australian Battalion refused to take part in an attack. This was in protest to being sent back into the lines when they were supposed to be relieved. They were not charged with desertion in the face of the enemy, which was punishable by execution, just with being absent without leave. And the week comes to an end, with the Allies routing the enemy in Palestine and Macedonia, but launching two offensives on the Western Front that both see initial success 
but grind down after just a couple of days. I'll end today with some more numbers, these from Chronology of the Great War, just to sort of give you a scale of how things are going. On the Western Front, from July 15th to September 30th, the Allies took 248,494 soldiers prisoner, 5,518 officers, 23,000 machine guns, and 3,669 big guns. They also took 25,000 prisoners of war in Macedonia and 70,000 in Palestine. That is over a third of a million prisoners in 75 days. That is a staggering figure, and sometimes I have to give these numbers to remind us of the true scale of the war. But those 345,000 men were actually the lucky ones. They weren't the hundreds of thousands of men who were killed then or are soon to be killed. Their war was over. If you'd like to know more about the fate of those men that were taken prisoner, you can click right here for a special episode about prisoners of war. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Liban Osman Rublin Niva. Thank you for your ongoing support on Patreon, which made this show possible over the years. Please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash thegreatwar. And do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.